Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen, and I'm the Executive Director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York in Bayside, Queens. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. Today's event, Gendered Memories, the Legacy of Sexual Violence in Bosnia and Herzegovina, features four special guests. Dr. Sabiha Husic, Director of Association Medica Zenica, Tanya Domi, Adjunct Assistant Professor at Columbia's Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs and an affiliate faculty member of the Harriman Institute, Hassan Hassanovic, Head of the Oral History Project at the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial and himself a genocide survivor, and Anne Petrilla, Professor of the Practice and Coordinator of Global Initiatives at the University of Denver's Graduate School of Social Work. The event is co-sponsored by the Sam and Francis Freed Holocaust and Genocide Academy at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, the Holocaust Genocide and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College, the Ray Walpaw Institute at Western Washington University, the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University, the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, and the Martin Springer Institute at, the Nor at Northern Arizona University. Before we begin to housekeeping notes, we are recording today's event. You'll be able to watch it afterwards. And please be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now, before we begin, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the events leading up to the genocide in Srebrenica, the municipality in which this conversation will be centered around, as we'll be discussing the challenges of documenting women's experiences at the memorial there. The 1992 to 1995 Bosnian War has its roots in the collapse of what was known as the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia under its then president, Josip Broz Tito, during the economic crisis of the late 1970s. Prior to his death in 1980, Tito had already begun the process of decentralizing federal authority to each of the socialist republics, including Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Macedonia, and Montenegro. Around that time, Serbia began jostling for control of Yugoslavia. Still, an integrated socio-cultural climate continued to exist within Bosnia up until Serbian and Bosnian Serb ethno-nationalist rhetoric entered the discourse in the late 1980s, early 1990s. In 1991, Slovenia became the first republic to secede, erupting in a brief 10-day war with Serbia. Croatia followed suit and followed Serbia in a, and fought Serbia in a ferocious four-year war. Even though intermittent hostilities had already begun, the Bosnian War formally began on April 6, 1992, just a single day before the European Union recognized the country's independence. The Drina Valley is in eastern Bosnia bordering Serbia and is where the Bosnian Serb army and associated militias began their ethnic cleansing campaign in early 1991. The picture you are looking at is one of the execution sites in Kuzluk where a mass grave of over 805 men and boys were found including Hassan's brother. The region was formerly home to 37,000 residents of mixed ethnicities with a majority of Bosnian Muslim, also known as Bosniak inhabitants. In the Srebrenica municipality alone, 296 villages were ethnically cleansed during the first three months of the war. In 1993, the Srebrenica enclave was declared one of six safe havens by United Nations Security Resolutions 819 and 824. On July 11, 1995, Srebrenica, under the protection of the Dutch UN peacekeepers, also known as Dutchbat, was overrun by the Bosnian Serb army. Approximately 20 to 25,000 refugees had fled into the neighboring village of Potocari and gathered in the immediate areas surrounding the peacekeeping compound. Between five to 6,000 refugees, mostly women, were allowed in entry into the base, but eventually expelled. The women and girls were forcibly bus to the free territory in Tuzla, while the men and boys were taken to nearby areas and murdered. The last time these families saw one another was on the highway in front of the peacekeeping compound, also known as the Battery Factory. Meanwhile, a separate column of approximately 10 to 15,000 Bosniak men and boys and a few women had fled into the mountains between July 11th and 12th, 1995. While a small number of men were able to survive, including Hassan, this would later become known as the Death March as over the next 11 days, over 8,000 Bosniak men and boys were executed by the Bosnian Serb army. The Srebrenica genocide is the single largest massacre to take place in Europe since World War II. The killings were formally declared genocide during the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia's case against the Bosnian Serb army Deputy General Radislav Krstic. In 2017, Rako Mladic, Bosnian Serb army 
colonel general was found guilty of committing, of committing war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide by the ICTY. And in 2019, Radovan Krajic, the wartime president of the Republic of Srpska, was convicted of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes by the tribunal. The Dayton Peace Agreement ended the war on November 21st, 1995, and Bosnia became one state with two political entities. The Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, a coalition between Bosniaks and Croats, and the Republic of Srpska governed by Bosnian Serbs. Srebrenica was assigned to the Republic of Srpska. Bosnia is also a country with a tripartite presidency that includes one Bosniak, one Bosnian Serb, and one Bosnian Croat representative, and no less than 14 separate governments, the federal government, the two entity governments, 10 cantonal governments within the federation, and the self-governing city of Birchko. When the war ended, over 2 million people, approximately half the country's population were internally displaced and or had fled abroad. Roughly 100,000 were left dead and tens of thousands of women had been raped. We know from news reports, the accounts of a few brave survivors and ICTY documentation that women from Srebrenica who were raped, were raped during July, 1995. But finding other sources about the horrors Srebrenica's women experienced, specifically sexual violence, however, is difficult because of the community's intense culture of enforced silence around it. We also often don't hear about the rapes in Srebrenica because of the emphasis is on the suffering of Bosniak men's and national losses. Much of the discourse of wartime rapes also focuses on where notorious rape camps existed, such as in Focha, where survivors testified at the ICTY, resulting in a landmark case declaring rape as a weapon of war, and in Visegrad, where the infamous rape camp, the Velina Vlas Hotel, reopened to tourists using some of the same furniture. The memorialization of women's wartime experiences, including sexual violence, is still a challenge given there are so many other pressing issues affecting women. Many of these are directly connected to the mass rapes, including domestic violence, endemic poverty, and psychological disorders. And female survivors of wartime rape are still fighting for justice, financial reparations, psychological support, and community acceptance. This is a country where it is still considered inflammatory to also acknowledge that women of all three ethnicities were raped. The silence can be traced to three possible phenomena, and a lot of which we'll talk about today. The first is the complex relationship between the exceptional levels of wartime physical and sexual violence that men waged across women's bodies, as well as the normalization of this power to achieve nationalist aims. The second derives from how Bosnian cultural and religious norms reinforce patriarchal boundaries that impact what can and cannot be said, as well accentuate the rigid expressions of these customs in more rural areas. And finally, there is the centrality of situating women's victimhood, as Elisa Helms argues, within claims of moral purity and absolute innocence. Now, to get things started, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sabiha Husic. Dr. Husic is a psychotherapist and interreligious peace builder and the director of NGO Medica Zenica in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Dr. Husic obtained her PhD in Gender Studies at the University of Sarajevo, and her doctoral thesis was entitled Criticism and Transformation of Social Support Models for Survivors of War, Sexual Violence in Bosnia-Herzegovina, Feminist and Cultural Perspectives. She has been working as a psychotherapist for 29 years directly with survivors of war and post-war gender-based violence. Dr. Husic also initiated, developed methodology, and established in both Bosnia and Herzegovina and in the Western Balkan region, the first institutional networks for support to both survivors and survivors who were witnesses to war crimes, sexual violence, and other criminal offenses. She is an author and co-author of many publications on the topic of psychosocial work with survivors, and she initiated and participated in developing and adopting many policies and laws in Bosnia in the field of social protection, gender-based violence, gender equality, and human rights protections, and she has also received many national and international awards for her engagement, commitment, and dedicated work. Dr. Husic, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to participate today and thanks a lot organizers for inviting me and giving me this op opportunity to share some uh, of my work uh, or experiences working with survivors of sexual violence and wartime rape. In Bosnia and Herzegovina during the war from 1992 till 1995, women were exposed to multiple trauma of wartime rape and sexual violence 
losses being refugees, dealing with missing members of families, wounds, and so on. Approximately 50,000 women and children, girls under 18 years old, and 3,000 men and boys survived sexual violence in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Wartime rape and sexual violence is the most difficult form of violation of human rights, very often without possibility to describe all the consequences. They felt fear, helplessness, and hopelessness after they survived wartime rape and sexual violence. They felt humiliation. Some of them made suicide. They lost control over their life. It was an attack on their intimate part of the life. They survived special psychological trauma that keeps them in silence with the long psychological, social, economical, and health consequences. Wartime rape and sexual violence was an attack of dignity of human beings and their families. Also, survivors have been afraid of the reactions of families and communities. Some of their family members have looked at them as worthless and responsible for destruction of the face of the family or credibility. Credibility of husband, men members of families or complete families. Survivors didn't get social support and empathy for their pain and suffering at the beginning of the war. All those reasons make influence on survivors' life that they stay in silence and isolations. They have recognized stigmatization in the community, which contribute that survivors have developed self-stigmatization through self-blaming self and dealing with shame. One of survivors explained it during her therapy work with me. I have only one wish. It is to die. My wish to die is stronger than my wish to live. In that situation, feminist activists led by women's solidarity decided to support and help survivors of war, rape and sexual violence, as well as encourage survivors to speak up about her, their horrible experiences. Monica Hauser was one of the feminists and activists who came in Zenica in Bosnia and Herzegovina and together with Bosnian women established first women's organization Medica Zenica in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where I work from that time till now. We are listening voices of survivors following their needs we have developed holistic and comprehensive support, including medical support, individual and group therapy work, occupational therapy, legal support, provision of vocational training for survivors to finish some courses and get skills to find easily job in the community or to start own business. It was also so important to support women in their own decisions regarding children born as a result of wartime rape. Some of survivors gave their children for adoption of their fa other families or institutions for children without pa parents. Some decided to keep their children with themselves, but they had problems with their parents. Their parents accepted them, but they didn't want to, ac to accept their children born after wartime rape. In that situation, we have also worked with parents of survivors to understand importance of accepting survivors as well as their children. As I said, in Medica Zenica, we listen to women and their stories, build a trust among us, and create safe place for survivors. It was so important that survivors have freedom in making own decisions. 
we together contribute to break prejudice towards survivors such as women are guilty, they provoked perpetrators, what we have been hearing almost every day. After 10 years, our work with survivors and fighting for their better life conditions, Medica Zenica decided to organize a round table, table with the topic 10 years after surviving wartime rape and sexual violence, how we can help and support survivors and their children together. We invited representatives from government institutions, non-governmental organizations, associations of survivors, religions, communities, media, international organizations to participate during that round table and explore opportunities, how we can work together and develop some mechanisms of reparation for survivors. All of participants agreed with the idea that survivors need systematic support provided in collaboration by government institutions, international organizations, religions, communities, and NGOs. One conclusion of the round table was that survivors need to get the rights such as financial support, health insurance, psychological support, and legal support, educational support, and priority in employment. Women from Medica Zenica, in cooperation with 20 NGOs, made lobby for that law. In the same time, the film Grbavica got a word, Golden Bear. The film was about women who survived wartime rape and gave birth to a child, but she didn't explain her daughter who her father was. Survivor worked and struggled for her daughter to attend school and have everything what other children in her class had. One day, her daughter requested from her mother to explain where is the family of her father and who is her father. Mother wanted to protect her daughter, but daughter insisted and mother in a very rude manner explained who her father was. Yasmila Zbanic, director of the film Grbavica, as a very young director, participated during our round table. After she got the award, Golden Bear, we NGOs decided to organize campaign for dignity of survivors in Bosnia and Herzegovina as the next step in contributing to developing mechanisms for survivors reparation. Women from 20 NGOs collected more than 50,000 signatures from our citizens for the adoption of the law that would recognize survivors with their rights. 50 signatures were given to the Federal Parliament of Bosnia and Herzegovina with clear request that survivors of wartime rape and sexual violence need to be recognized in the law with their rights. We collaborate with women from the parliaments from different political parties to support the law and request from their sides to speak also with their male colleagues who were in the parliaments. That process took time and huge efforts from women's sides. Finally, after all activities and three years of the process in 2006, the federal parliament of Bosnia and Herzegovina adopted the law by which survivors were recognized as a special category of civil victims of the war. It means that survivors got an opportunity to obtain to the status of civil victims of war, a special category as one of the forms of reparation since 2006. Special category means that women 
survived wartime rape and sexual violence, and they were recognized as victims of brutal kind of violence. However, it was first time in history that survivors of wartime rape and sexual violence were recognized in the law. It is one form of reparation through the social protection systems and implementation of the law. In the research, which I did in 2019, survivors described what the status means for them. 56% of them answered its economic safety for 22% social acknowledgement or recognition. And for 17% of them, it means support. I also want to emphasize that the law recognized persons who survived wartime rape and sexual violence. It means that the law has gender neutral norms that women and men can obtain the status of civil victims of the war. This model was one of possibilities for reparation, or I can see in other words, it was non-traditional instrument for social justice that we women in Bosnia and Herzegovina initiated, recognized and developed first practices together with survivors. It wasn't easy, but it was so important for survivors and their dignity. Survivors were motivated after getting support and understanding to give their testimonies of hard and painful experiences of wartime rape and sexual violence during the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It contributed that war rape and sexual violence were recognized as a weapon of war and war criminal act, criminal act against humanity and the genocide on international and national level. Their voices contributed that more than 100 perpetrators were punished for wartime rape and sexual violence at the International Court in The Hague and courts in Bosnia. As the survivors explained, we have been harmed, but we are brave and strong. These survivors can contribute to prevent sexual violence and break impunity of perpetrators and develop society where justice will be recognized. They show dignity in life and to be clear that shame and humiliation belong to perpetrators uh, and not to survivors of wartime rape. They take active roles in society, participated in co concrete actions in their family and community. They recognize and transform their own strengths and describe themselves as survivors, not only as victim in Bosnia and Herzegovina. From the beginning till now, I can say that we have done a lot, but we need to continue. Continue with holistic and comprehensive work with survivors, but also work with members of families to prevent transgeneration trauma transmission support and help for survivors to recover from their trauma and learning from life stories of survivors. Organizing and leading training on the psychosocial field for actors or stakeholders. Institutions need to be educated about stress trauma sensitive approach, raise awareness to prevent stigmatization of survivors and their families. Creating community where survivors can return dignity and feel good and respected. Establish good coordination and communication among stakeholders. And we also need to improve our cooperation with religious communities. 
we recognize younger generations use as huge capacity for, transfer for transformative and collaborative work and positive changes in our society. Only together we can create better atmosphere and prevent the stigmatization of survivors and their families, as well as motivate survivors for speaking up, giving testimonies and request for their rights and justice. Thank you so much. And the end of this, my presentation, I also want to share with you one very short video. Je tad bilo 18 godina i bila sam u drugom mjesecu trudnoće. I sad osjetim taj strah kad se sjetim šta se dešavalo. Ja sam u svom gradu obilježena. U mene se čitav život upire prstom. Bila sam bespomoćna, ponižena, gladna i žena. Smrt od života mi je bila potrebnija. Odvodili su, silovali su curice, cure, mlađe žene. A i ja sam bila curica. Prijetili su ako ikove me kažemo da će nas ubiti. Nisam mogla plakati. Sve je u meni bilo zamrznuto. I knew that I was hard after the killing and that abortus can't be done in the war. That was an additional shock for me and my family. That act of killing is the most important part of my life. That is the most important part of my life. I can't get out of it. 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 Treba misliti na lijepe stvari. Nije me više stid. Ponosna sam, snažna i hrabra, što sam zavoljela i prihvatila dijete. Nije me bilo lahko, ali sam je zavoljela i ona je moja sto posto. Neću da dozvolim sebi da se u životu fokusiram samo na moju bol, na silovanje. Eto. Zato sam ja pobjednica. Thank you so much, Dr. Husic. Um, 
we will put in the chat information about Yasmila Zvanich. She's a Bosnian director who directed Grbavica, which um, Dr. Husic mentioned. She also, the director, um, created Quo Vadis Aida, which was a film about the Srebrenica genocide, which was um, released last year. So now to turn to the discussion about how to prosecute rape at the international level, I'd like to introduce Tanya Domi. Tanya is an adjunct assistant professor of international public affairs at Columbia University and a faculty affiliate of the Harriman Institute. The focus of her research is policy oriented on transitional justice issues, including women's and LGBTQIA plus human rights, genocide and atrocity crimes. Prior to joining the faculty at Harriman in 2008, Domi worked for the late Congressman Frank Buklowski, a champion for US intervention to stop the Bosnian war. She served as his defense policy analysis during the first two years of the Balkan Wars, and she was seconded by the State Department to the OSCE BIH mission between 1996 and 2000, serving in major roles as an advisor to the late U.S. Ambassador Robert Frowick and counselor under U.S. Ambassador Robert Berry. She later served as the OSCE, OSCE spokesperson between 1999 and 2000. She's currently the president of the advisory board of the Bosnian-based Post-Conflict Research Center and is also a non-residential fellow, senior fellow at the Alliance for Peacebuilding based in Washington, DC. Domi is a widely published author and commentator on US foreign policy, human rights and international relations. And she co-authored her most recent piece in the March, 2022 issue of Foreign Policy with Hikmet Karcic entitled, We Need a Better Way to Prosecute Sexual Assault in Conflict. Tanya, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lori, and I want to thank um, Sabia for her presentation. It, it makes real the injustice of rape during conflict. Um, the work that is done by her organization is just absolutely vital to all the survivors. Um, I'm deeply moved by the film as well. Um, first off, let me just say that um, most of the groundbreaking international jurisprudence on sexual violence was generated by ad hoc tribunals, namely the International War Crimes Tribunal for former Yugoslavia and also the International War Crimes Tribunal uh, in Rwanda. So even though laws have existed uh, with respect to uh, prohibiting sexual violence, uh, have existed since 1907, they were never prosecuted um, in an international court of law until the Rwanda and former Yugoslav courts were established. And I would say that uh, later following the 1907 Hague Convention, uh, which uh, conveyed that family honor and rights must be respected was the first law, but it was ignored by the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals. And I would make note of two facts. One is uh, it is estimated that more than 200,000 women were raped and enslaved in the Asian theater of World War II. And in the liberation of Berlin uh, at the end of World War II, more than 2 million German women were raped by Russian soldiers. And I would add, uh, as we all know, there is a war taking place right now in Ukraine. And during the second week of the war, um, I have noted the first reports of rape of women. And there are survivors of women that were raped during the 2014 uh, annexation of Crimea under Mr. Putin as well. Now, just so everyone knows, the International uh, Criminal Court has announced that they have opened an uh, investigation into war crimes, and they specifically note the rapes of women going back to 2014 in Ukraine. And so that is um, 
that is quite noteworthy and never is unprecedented in its early articulation. Um, in 1949, after World War II, uh, the landmark Geneva Conventions were adopted by the UN setting standards for the treatment of civilian populations during war. And specifically it stated uh, women shall be especially protected against rape and forced prostitution or any form of indecent assault. But it was not until the breakup of the former Yugoslavia when two survivors of sexual assault, Yadranka Sigli and Nusreta Shevats, uh, actually collected over 200 testimonies in the refugee camps in Croatia. And they took those testimonies to The Hague. The court had been established during the war, but they had not uh, indicated that they were going to prosecute uh, sexual violence. Uh, although it was documented by reporters and also by a noted human rights authority, Gay McDougall, who came through uh, former Yugoslavia in 1993, documenting the rape and enslavement of women throughout the former Yugoslav space that was in conflict. So both these lawyers gathered more than 200 testimonies. They too were survivors, both lawyers, one was a judge, and they took these testimonies to the prosecutors and persuaded them to indeed prosecute rape for the first time in the history of international jurisprudence. So during the Bosnian war from 92 to 95, Bosnian Serb forces strategically targeted women, children, and many men detained in concentration camps. The worst such incident occurred in 1992 in the Luka concentration camp in the town of Birchko, where Bosnian Serb authorities detained Bosnian Muslims and Croats. Many of the male survivors of sexual violence have rarely spoken about their experiences given the taboos around sexual abuse that were perpetrated against men. I would also say that uh, in total, the International War Crimes Tribunal for former Yugoslavia charged more than 70 individuals with crimes of sexual violence, including sexual assault and rape, ultimately convicting 32 of these defendants. This produced landmark international jurisprudence with respect to sexual violence during conflict in a few different cases since 2000 the tribunal found rape to be a crime against humanity, an act of torture, a tool of terror. And I would also add there was a charge of enslavement and this was based upon Gay McDougall's extensive reporting that was submitted uh, to the UN, um, the UN Special Rapporteur uh, on, on Yugoslavia. Uh, and this did establish a link between rape and ethnic cleansing, which is also a crime against humanity. The one failure that I'll, I will speak to here is though, that ICTI failed to establish that rape was a component of genocide, though an estimated up to 50,000 rapes were perpetrated during the Bosnian war. The legal, uh, the legal landmark and precedent uh, declaring rape as a component of genocide was actually uh, founded in the Rwanda tribunal in 1998. And I actually do find this to be an unfortunate omission by ICTI because the precedent was established uh, when a case was brought against Jean-Paul Aka Seyu, who was a mayor of a uh, constituency uh, who became the first person in, convicted for directing rapes of Tutsis, 
establishing this precedent that rape and sexual violence can constitute genocide. It was, it was used also to convict a woman, uh, Pauline Niramasu Kuto, who actually was a Rwandan minister for family welfare and the advancement of women, who actually ordered the rape and murder of Tutsi women and girls. Now, I will also point to the case going back to Bosnia that the General Kerstich prosecution originally included uh, crimes that were rape, rapes that were carried out at Srebrenica uh, during uh, the deportation of people. And also, as we all know, what happened, the mass killing of more than 8,000 Muslim men and boys. Women too were raped in that crime during the course of that crime, but those rapes were severed from the Kerstich case and they were, they were prosecuted separately, thereby, I think, um, actually stepping back from finding rape as a component of genocide during the Bosnian War. And I do think this is regrettable. Um, I would uh, also add that uh, there are a number of wars that are happening right now, including um, in uh, Ethiopia, it is just an unbelievable description of what's taking, uh, taking place there, mass gang rapes. There are seven different parties to this war. Um, it has been noted by the UN that, uh, that this is taking place. There have been some prosecutions in the past year, and there are now about 25 uh, men being prosecuted by the Ethiopian State Supreme Court. But still, this is a reality for lots of people throughout the world. And I would also add, add that the ICC has, has indeed, as I mentioned earlier, has launched an investigation into Ukraine and they are uh, listing cr uh, crimes that began since 2013 uh, that include sexual assaults. And um, so it's not, uh, it's not missed on anyone that, cr uh, that rape as a crime, uh, as a war crime continues to this very moment. Let me just summarize by saying that the vast majority of survivors and their families will never attain justice. This is because political leaders often lack the requisite political will to pursue prosecution of these crimes in courts they oversee. As a result, there's a paucity of courts with jurisdiction over sexual violence committed during war. And despite the best efforts of uh, the women, peace and security apparatus at the United Nations, UN Security Council 1325, um, uh, victims and survivors of conflict related sexual violence are generally underserved by public agencies intended to provide reparations and health care for survivors of wartime sexual violence. And while, uh, you know, Sabiha actually laid out the case uh, in passing the law, the civil victims uh, law in Bosnia, it has been noted by the Global Fund uh, that indeed, uh, the entitlement to care and compensation through this program has really been less effective than, and it does not uh, uphold to international standards according to the Global Fund report that is going to be finally presented. A pre-report pre was uh, presented at the UN General Assembly uh, meeting last year, and the final report will actually be delivered this coming fall. Um, so I would just add by saying there must be a redoubling of political will by the world community with respect to preventing conflict-related sexual violence. 
and the work of the Global Survivors Fund is working um, in partnership with the UN on these issues regarding reparations. And I would just add that reparations for men and women survivors of sexual assault is very important because it's an acknowledgement of persecution and acknowledgement of harm and that someone has witnessed and said, yes, we see what happened to you. This has caused great harm. And the follow-up care that Sevilla has also talked about is just so important because the rape never leaves a victim and the consequences in many cases uh, leaves chronic health problems for the survivors as well as trauma that must be dealt with from a psychological standpoint. Um, I would also add that, um, that this engagement also requires acknowledgement of harm. And to this day, neither Bosnian Serbs that were engaged in the war, nor uh, Serbia itself has ever acknowledged the extensive rapes of women in the Bosnian War. And moreover, this is also true of what happened in Kosovo. More than 20,000 women have been raped and the, the survivors have been organizing quite uh, diligently here in the United States, asking Biden, President Biden to intervene in our article. And I asked people to take a look at the article because we do lay out the case for them to seek redress. There has been only one prosecution of rape that occurred uh, during the Kosovo War. So with that, I will end my comments and I look forward to hearing um, our other colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. It's um, it's sobering that we're still focusing on both uh, the, the, the impact of these rapes at the individual level and still frustrated with very little progress um, in outlawing them at the international level. I'd like to now turn to Hassan Hassanovich, um, who's the head of the Oral History Project at the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial, where he educates thousands of visitors each year. Hassan survived the genocide, but other family members did not, including his twin brother and his father. He's a co-author with Anne Petrilla of Voices from Srebrenica, Survivor Narratives of the Bosnian Genocide. Hassan is frequently interviewed by the international press, is a keynote speaker at events around the world, and his memoir, Surviving Srebrenica, has been translated into several languages. He has also addressed the Scottish and Flemish Houses of Parliament, as well as had a private reception at the UK Prime Minister's official office. Hassan has led oral history projects with the Sarajevo War Child Museum and the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, curated the video exhibit, Srebrenica, Our Story, at the memorial, and currently oversees an oral history collaboration with the Shoah Foundation. He is also a permanent member of the Srebrenica Peace March Organizing Committee, a 110 kilometer walk that commemorates the men and boys murdered during the death march of which he is a survivor. Hassan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank to the organizers for organizing um, this very important um, event on sexual violence in, in the Bosnian war. Uh, so what I want to talk about is the actual uh, uh, situation at the memorial in Srebrenica, uh, where I have been working for uh, almost 14 years. Uh, I spent um, uh, over um, 11 years working with visitors uh, as a curator telling the story of the genocide. Um, and uh, regarding to this uh, particular subject of sexual violence, uh, it was never the subject. Uh, it was always um, a taboo. Uh, we never talked about that um, at the memorial. Uh, there was never um, a curated uh, text for visitors in any of our exhibitions. Uh, so visitors uh, were deprived of, uh, uh, of, of of that fact. Uh, they, they were not able to find out anything about this subject at the memorial for 
uh, all these all these years. Um, to be, you know, as a survivor um, of the death march and uh, somebody who I actually, I actually lost um, uh, my father, my twin brother, my uncle, and a, a lot of other family members. Uh, we, you know, among ourselves, you know, we heard a lot of stories of women who had been raped um, during the genocide. Uh, but uh, I never, I never knew uh, those women in person, you know, because of our uh, tradition, uh, because of the fact that, um, um, uh, you know, women issues were always, uh, in a way, hidden. Uh, women could not talk openly about, uh, you know, uh, their things. Uh, so uh, I was always, uh, I felt really uncomfortable when visitors um, asked me uh, what I knew about rape, and I knew nothing except for just uh, uh, that notion that uh, sexual violence had happened. Uh, there were some researchers who wanted to know more, and I couldn't uh, tell them anything, you know, especially you know in details. They 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 wanted to meet uh, women survivors of sexual violence, and I actually had no information. You know, I could not even refer uh, to any of of those women who had been raped. So um, I always, you know, wondered if uh, this uh, narrative would ever be um, uh, 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 displayed at the memorial, <clears throat> and. Um, it's it's um it it is actually changing uh, a, a a little bit because um it's been over two two and a half years um since I since I'm since I'm been doing the oral history and actually running the program and you know, but we interviewed over uh, three hundred uh, survivors uh, among them there were many women uh, who survived the genocide um, and they, they are mainly survivors from Potocari, from the UN base. And um, just listening to these stories, you know, they never, they almost never talk, talked about their, their personal uh, personal uh, experience in um, sexual violence, but they, 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 what they were talking about was that they saw other women who they were related to, who they had a relationship with, uh, either they were family members or friends, uh, and uh, they saw them being taken away while uh, they were outside of the human base going to uh, to the water well, and uh, they were pulled 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 away from from soldiers, and they um, were taken away, uh, and. Um, um, there are a number of, of these stories uh, where uh, women, uh, you know, when, when I interviewed them, there was, I remember there was a woman who said, you know, I was taken away and she paused and she, she did not continue. She did, she did not continue any, in, in any details. And I did not insist because I couldn't, because I'm not qualified into I'm not qualified in, in um, interviewing women of sexual violence. Uh, I just uh, paused as well. And then she just skipped and she started to talk about um, something else. And she also mentioned that many women uh, had been raped. And, uh, you know, she took a, a really long breath. And I realized how big trauma it is for her personally and for women that she she um, was related to uh, who had that experience. Um, I also interviewed a women who saw uh, that women had been taken away uh, near the free territory uh, before reaching the before reaching the front line where uh, women and children had been uh, ordered to get off those buses and trucks and were made to walk for uh, a few miles to the free territory uh, on foot. Uh, before reaching the free territory, um, especially girls uh, who were not married yet because they were not carrying children, uh, they had been um, pulled away, taken away 
and uh, many women talk about um, um, the fact that there was uh, like a bar, like a like a prefabricated wooden hut, uh, and with girls and with some women were taken away there and 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 were raped. Uh, one of the women said that a soldier came to a young woman and, and wanting to take her away and her mother uh, tried to resist and he took her away as well. So both mother and daughter were taken to, to that place uh, to be raped. Uh, so uh, what I am actually hoping for is that um, at the memorial one day we will hopefully in a collaboration with um, an, one organization which might be Sabiha's organization that we uh, should um, at some point interview um, these women um, a number of them if they are willing to talk and uh, of course we should do it um, in a way that we um, produce, that we actually create a methodology, that we consult with uh, such organizations such as Sabihas, what should be done to, to, to make sure that, that uh, women are treated in the best way possible while telling the story, and what are the, the mechanisms for their identity protection and, uh, and uh, how the stories should be treated and used in education later. So this is a big challenge, I assume, for the memorial, for the society, and the, a challenge which we should take up. Uh, and um, I think uh, it's very important because uh, at the memorial, we really should have um, a, a narrative describing uh, sexual violence in the Bosnian war, and especially explaining what happened to uh, women of Srebrenica uh, who um, had been raped. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, that time is is um, is coming. Um, so um, I'm just hoping that uh, this. Um, uh, Tonight's event will will um, contribute to 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 this uh, issue that uh, in future will 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 go ahead with um, a project uh, in in a proper way, you know, to to be able to preserve these stories. And while working on on the book with Anne Voices from Srebrenica, uh, Narratives of the Bosnian War, uh, we um, in a way uh, mentioned. Uh, these, um, this, this subject, and uh, uh, it was almost impossible to find uh, women who we could interview. Uh, and um, uh, interviewed uh, Sabiha uh, for uh, uh for 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 the book to, that we actually provide this uh, part of the narrative for our readers. Um, to conclude, uh, I'm hoping that the memorial in future will have a, a, um, a project where we will be able to interview a number of women who had been raped during the, the genocide in Srebrenica, and that we will be able to use those stories to educate uh, people globally uh, about this very important uh, issue uh as a as a man who as a young man who survived the, the the death march i also want to emphasize that um uh, i really um feel for what women have gone through uh also um there, there are so many there there, there are there are, there are many other issues uh, uh, uh which were not uh treated properly in, in bosnian state laws uh, so I'm happy that, uh, as Sabiha mentioned, that uh, women of sexual violence were recognized 
in the law in the Federation of Bosnia as as, as civil victims that they can have at least um, um, financial security, even though uh, all survivors, including women of sexual violence, every day on at every step encounter secondary victimization uh, and stigmatization. So I hope that we will change this. And I see this um, uh, event tonight as a contribution to, to uh, that change. Thank you so much, Hassan. We've talked over many years of sort of the progression of understanding the 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 different ways that Srebrenica is is memorialized, and um, maybe during the Q and A, we can talk a little bit about the mother's um, role in advocating for the memorial and also shaping the narrative. Um, I'd like to now introduce Anne Petrilla, who is a professor of the practice and coordinator of global initiatives at the University of Denver's Graduate School of Social Work. She's a co-author with Hassan of Voices from Srebrenica, Survivor Narratives of the Bosnian Genocide. And Anne's areas of expertise include global cultural perspectives, trauma, grief, genocide, and oral histories. She and Hassan are in the final stages of completing an educational documentary and curriculum modules entitled The World Speaks and We Listen, which uses the voices of people throughout Bosnia who survived the war and the genocide to share their wisdom with U.S. students of social work and human rights. Every summer, Anne leads an experiential Bosnia-based course and internship program for University of Grad University of Denver graduate students, and to date has taken close to 300 university students to the country. Anne, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. And um, thank you for to you and your staff for hosting this incredibly important um, discussion today and panel. And I'm very honored to be um, included in it along with um, my colleagues who we have already heard from. And in listening to um, Hassan and Tanya and Sabiha, I, I was so struck by just how very difficult this topic is, even on an individual level or on a smaller scale level. For um, people in this case, I will focus on women who have been a victim of sexual um, violence. All of the issues that have been brought up so far in this talk of um, mass sexual violence um, in war are, are present, aren't they? With, with stigma, with shame, with fear, with um, power differentials, all of the things. And I think about how we are still struggling as as a human race, actually, to address these issues even on an individual scale. And then when you uh, multiply it times tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, how very, very important it is that we we start to figure this out and pay attention to this in a way that is useful to people and preventative as well. Um, several people have mentioned the movie um, Gerbevica on the panel, I noticed in the um, comments, there were some people who use that movie in teaching and I do as well. It's a movie that um, I would encourage people to watch and I use it in several of my classes, um, especially those focused on, well, all of my classes actually focused on trauma, um, genocide, Bosnia, um, victimization, all those sorts of things, because it is really a movie that does, um, it, uh, does illustrate all of these issues from all of the angles. The, the, the woman who was uh, raped, the child who was born, all of the issues around that. And I, I've been thinking about this so much um, with, with what's happening in Ukraine, which has also been mentioned. And in following the press of um, the, the written press, as well as the, um, the TV, the radio that people, journalists and others are reporting on this. Um, and there have been very, very few references to rape and sexual violence that are happening currently. In Ukraine, Tanya mentioned um, documentation of rape that has happened there going back several years. And currently, I think that per, I have seen three or heard three references in all of that I have been watching and reading um, about, about what is going on there. And, um, and then with two out of the three, it was sort of innuendoed. It was, it was not using terms like rape, like sexual violence, those sorts of things. Um, and so my thought is, is it, are we yet in another situation where this is happening at a, at a large scale, organized scale that we're not talking about even as it's happening, even in a war that is playing out um, day by day in, on the press, in the press on, um, you know, again, in, in the written word that, that we have to continue to advocate as others have said for this, this to be talked about it directly um, in ter terms that people understand, not innuendos, um, 
And Sabiha's uh, program is is so amazing. And Sabiha, I was so moved, as others have said, by the video that you showed and the courage that that took for people to participate in that um, and the care with which you presented presented them and their their stories that they were willing to share. So all of this um, brings me to the point of really the ethics of being involved in, in um, efforts to bring this issue of rape, wartime violence um, to the forefront and who should be involved and how should we be involved. And um, as, as Hassan mentioned, when we were interviewing people for our book, um, I, I kept saying to him, I mean, I, I knew we couldn't and I didn't want to seek people out, uh, particularly with this issue. Again, that's it's uh, because of the sensitivity, because of the trauma-informed nature of needing to interview people, all of that. But I, I was so struck by the fact that it was not coming up ever, and except in very, very um, sort of maybe vague or generalized terms or by, by policy people, it was coming up. And... Um, and that made me start to think, as I always do, about the ethics of being involved in work um, in Bosnia as, a, as an outsider, an outside academic, um, that the ethics in this particular issue, though, are even more complicated, I think, because there's the ethics of not being involved and not mentioning it and not um, talking about it or not trying to elevate it um, to the level it needs to be to be discussed the ethics of that and the, the almost conflicting ethics of trying to be involved and in what way and whose, whose place is it to be involved. So um, I, so that's a question I have and um, one that I uh, continue to wonder about and one that I am um, hoping in, in a minute I can ask Sabiha about her ideas about this, of what is um, the best way for the international community to be involved. We've heard from um, Tanya about being involved um, at the policy level and about um, her writing about the, the judicial system. Um, we've heard from um, Hassan about the work of the memorial. And, um, and, and, and I, I just wanna challenge all of us who are, who are on this call, who are interested in this topic to figure out what role can we play in, um, in really opening up this conversation even more. And Laura, your willingness to convene us tonight is a wonderful example of what we need to do. Because again, when I think about, and we all think about how difficult this topic is for any individual even, or any community, then um, the um, then it's really uh, almost unimaginable what it's like on such a mass scale. So, and I guess I, in closing, I would say when I, I think about um, even on an individual level with close friendships, whether it's people who were involved, who have been uh, vic victims or, and are survivors of sexual violence uh, in, on an individual level, on a more uh, a broader scale in, a, in a, a one setting or another, it takes quite a while in a relationship for people to be comfortable even sharing that with those that they are close to. So um, how can we work on a community and societal level to make it um, easier and um, more possible for people to share their stories and be um, supported in terms of the trauma, but also supported in ways that um, others have talked about um, with policy and with reparations and that sort of thing. So um, thank you for the chance to um, share those thoughts. And uh, I would like to shift now to um, the, the Q&A part of this program and um, would like to start if, um, if Sabiha is willing to let me start with her to ask um, you a question, Sabiha, that has shown up in our um, Q and A, and also is is one that um, I I am wondering about myself with this question of um, is there is there an additional role for for the international community in some way that you can see the question from one of um, the people who's participating today was were there are there any communities that are more accepting um, of the women and children. Um, that were um, victimized this way during the war. And in addition to that, um, there was a, a question earlier about um, 
what will, does your program work with the the children or and if not are there programs that are working with the children first of all thank you so much for that question uh, I want to emphasize that international community gave huge contribution, but uh, what I uh, would to recommend that international community need to work in continuation. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have one period when international community really support and help that sexual violence or survivors of sexual violence uh, were recognized on international level. After that, we on a local level work to be recognized in our, uh, 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 in our uh, law. But uh, we recognize some gaps when international community do not do from the beginning till the end to create sustainability for survivors when we speak about policy, when we speak about implementation of that policy or international documents, what our country ratified. Uh, and then I really uh, expe expect that international organization have continuation, but also to develop better monitoring system how all that documents implement uh, uh, in our country. It is not enough that we say that we have good policy without implementation, that good policy doesn't uh, mean anything for survivors. Uh, but however, we see when we need to uh, uh, write a report about human rights, for example, for us it's very important that we write about really situation, especially if we speak about survivors of sexual violence. We have in Bosnia and Herzegovina discrimination of these uh, 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 women or men uh, regarding place where they live. I can see we have territory of the uh, stigmatization. Uh, survivors or survivors do not have the same, the same right. For example, in Federation we mentioned, but in a Republika Srpska, Srpska or in Bučko district, survivors almost cannot apply for their status. I believe that uh, international community will listen us from uh, uh, from local level, I can say, from country and develop policy, but also very good instruments for monitoring. Thank you, Sabiha. I was so struck in your um, video by the woman who said, people in my uh, town or village point at me. Um, yes, and yes. And Yes, and it means what also my colleague Hassan said, we need to work uh, more regarding race awareness uh, to uh, destigmatize survivors, to put our finger to perpetrators. It's very important that perpetrators need to be punished for sexual violence and war time, uh, uh, war rape. I really think that is also some kind of a prevention in the future, not only in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also all over the world. Thank you so much, Sabiha. Um, I wanted to uh, ask, I was in Berchko many years ago and we were interviewing survivors up there and a woman had come in and it was very clear that she was in distress. And I remember um, that male survivor uh, talking about how he had to accompany her to counseling and to the gynecologist, because that's also very stigmatized. So getting mental health services and going for um, mm. any kind of doctor you know, work um, for, for women um, to be checked out. I wanted to ask um, Tanya something that which is absent from this conversation, which is so um, telling, is that we're having a conversation about sexual violence committed against women and men. We have not talked about um, this from an ethnic perspective. 
And I remember having a conversation with someone at UN Women who was talking about Republika Srpska being very, very invested in not talking about this at all, because this was a war waged on women's mm. bodies, not just Bosniak women and, and Bosnian Serb and Bosnian Croat women. And Tanya, I was wondering if you could just put this a little bit in context for us around the hostility that exists within the RS in terms of talking about the war, talking about sexual sure. violence. Well, just as Dr. Husich said, you know, you can't even really apply for reparations in the IRS as an example. So there's there's a legal in, uh, uh, obstacle to even seek redress uh, there. And I would also add, let's keep in mind, I didn't say this, but the first case tried by ICTI, Dusko Tadic, was in fact uh, sexual violence uh, by men against men. And, and we never talked about it. I mean, I remember this case and I was actually working and living in Sarajevo at that time. And we never talked about it. Nobody ever acknowledged it. It was like there was silence about the case itself. It wasn't even acknowledged. And so I think what Dr. Husich is saying and Anne is saying as well is that there must be prosecutions there must be prosecutions because the accountability is on the assailant, the rapist, not the victim, not the survivor. And as I said at the rally for her justice here in New York City, on behalf of Kosovo survivors, when we were rallying in front of the Serbian consulate in New York City, I said, not a single woman not a single survivor has any reason to be ashamed, but everyone in that building over there sure does. And that's what I also ended my comments saying, well, nobody's taken responsibility. As a matter of fact, what they do is they go out of their way to engage in genocide denial as we're fully familiar with. And genocide denial erases that incredible harm that was done to thousands and thousands of women and men. And um, I would also add that one of the ways that we can actually get people uh, caring for people, doing it the correct way, the, the um, effective way is from the inception in terms of the justice process, one of the recommendations that Dr. Karsich and I made in our article is that every court, every single court, especially the regional courts like um, the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court for Human Rights, the African Court, all the ad hoc uh, international courts, including the Kosovo Specialist Chamber, should be staffed with trained psychosocial staff that are working with the lawyers on how to interview um, survivors. And uh, I'm very sensitive to this. And I'm actually, I'm never even gonna think I ta told uh, Dr. Cohen this, but I am a trained survivor of, uh, I am a trained counselor and did this work on sex abuse victims in the United States, certainly not during war, but I learned how to do this as in, when I was stationed in Honolulu, Hawaii, because I set up uh, a mechanism with the United States Army there and the local community in Honolulu. So all I can say is that that has to be a pipeline of care that begins when the woman, when the survivor comes forward and through, the, through that process, they are properly cared for so that they are not re-traumatized. Thanks, Tanya. Um, Hassan, this next question is for you and um, reminds me of when um, I first started bringing students to Bosnia and actually even now, um, when we come, the question students often ask is when we get to Srebrenica, where, where's the story of the women? Um, and it's what you were discussing earlier of the memorial looking to, um, you know, to add some information about this, some um, exhibits, some, I mean, that's a, not quite the right word, but you know what I mean. Some, um, and um, so the question is, uh, to this point, what would you say um, if you could 
could describe for people the role that women have played in shaping the narrative um, at the memorial and what you, you would see in the future? You know, if it wasn't for the women, uh, we wouldn't have had the memorial at the Potocari in Srebrenica right now. So probably it would be maybe located or not existing, you know. Um, so it, it was it was women who organized themselves right after the genocide. I remember it was 1996. I was 20 years old. I was in Tuzla. It was first genocide commemoration in a huge sports center, Maidan. There were almost 10,000 survivors, mainly women and children. Uh, there was uh, CNN and a number of uh, news agencies there. Um, it was such a chaos. Um, there were some uh, human rights activists like Swanee Hunt, uh, uh, Emma Bonino, and some other human rights activists who came to support women, actually to advise them on what they should do to get together and to basically uh, have a word out uh, about the, the genocide. Um, then all of a sudden, um, 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 uh, a commemoration began, and uh, then they played a video. Uh, while they played the video, some women recognized their loved ones. Then they started to faint, which actually created a huge chaos. Then Queen Noor was there. She started to recite the Quran, the Holy Quran, and then she come. She, uh, she, she managed to calm the situation down. Um, and so this was the, the beginning where women uh, were advised to organize themselves into associations of women. Um, and they uh, basically took the streets of Tuzla, thousands of women uh, demanding from the authorities to deal with the, the issue of the missing, pressuring the whole world to find information about uh, those who were missing. And uh, um, it took a while. Uh, then um, when the first uh, mass graves were found, the, the, the ICMP, the International Commission on, on, on the Missing Persons, uh, was, was established in Bosnia, then uh, it was clear that uh, almost all men uh, and boys were killed. And the women started to advocate uh, for prosecution of war criminals for the memorial, for actually for the cemetery to be established first at, at Srebrenica. Then um, throughout, throughout these years, with the huge help uh, from uh, especially American administration, I have to say uh, and acknowledge uh, here, uh, contribution of uh, different American ambassadors uh, in, in Bosnia at the time who helped women of Srebrenica in, in advocating for the memorial to be established. Uh, the, the Srebrenica municipality was ran, ran by Serb uh, Serbs who Serb Democratic Party, Radovan Karadzic's uh, political party, and they did not allow they uh, they did not issue a permit for the cemetery to be to be established. Then the high representative of the international community uh, made this, this decision uh, with um, uh, a demand from the mothers, uh, and this is where it all started. Uh, the memorial was established uh, in 2000, uh, uh, and um, the construction the construction began, uh, and it was officially inaugurated in 2003 by ex-US President Bill Clinton. Uh, and uh, if it wasn't for the women, you know, women were visiting amb embassies on daily basis, uh, meeting with uh, different inter international delegations, uh, pressuring the world to find all the missing. Uh, uh, and this is why the uh, United States uh, 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 invested in, in, in the work of the ICTY. If it wasn't for the women, and uh, in, in my understanding, the United States, uh, probably the ICTY would never function. Uh, I mean, know how, what was the beginning of, from 1993, it was, it, they did not, <laughs> uh, you know, start really good. And because of Srebrenica uh, and because of the pressure, uh, they really did a wonderful job. Uh, you mentioned a number of verdicts, uh, with, uh, starting with uh, with Krstić and Tadic, and then uh, uh, it's really, really, really important. So it, to conclude, at the end, uh, uh, it it was women who set up the memorial, who set up the cemetery, 
And because of them, we have the memorial now. Because of them now, we can tell the story there. And their, their husbands were killed, their sons were killed, and almost all male family members. And they showed inc an incredible courage and resilience in telling the story. And even now, many of them live on their own uh, because they lost uh, each family member and they still tell the stories. They still share these, these experiences with, with uh, everyone who, who is willing to listen to them. And um, we will never be able to, to, to acknowledge and thank them enough for their work. And um, I'm very sad, you know, when I hear that uh, some of these women pass, uh, uh, passed away. Uh, I remember the, the death of Hatija Mahmedovic, who was one of the president of the Mothers of Srebrenica and uh, um, an incredible commemoration in Srebrenica where thousands of people attended and Anne was there as well. You know, which is really unbelievable, you know, what women can do. And uh, uh, I am convinced that uh, this, uh, what, what women did for the story of Srebrenica serves as a, an incredible exa exa example for the whole world to look, look up to and um, to be also used as a, as a research for, for um, uh, um, and, um, um, an example for many other women who are uh, seeking for their rights throughout, throughout the world. And uh, Tanya mentioned uh, what's happening now in, 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 in Ukraine, which I also follow up. And uh, um, I'm just hoping that um, uh, these, these atrocities will, will stop. And we have to, this is why it is very important to actually talk about all of these issues. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask uh, a question there. It's sort of two parts. And one is the relationship between time and healing versus time as a reflection. And this is a question that's come in from the audience. Time is a reflection of imposed silence and negative. Meaning, um, you know, over time are, do we feel like, and do you, do you have a sense that survive that the more time that survivors have their their healing and i guess the the the, the other part of that i'm just not getting this question out very clearly right now is um the impact of time in terms of testifying uh for prosecuting perpetrators and i open this up to the floor sabiha uh, thank you for that question. When we speak about time, first of all, I want to say <clears throat> time is important, but time is not a guarantee that some survivors will speak after 20, 30 years nevertheless. But what is very important that we be aware that we need to create good resources for survivors that they really feel safety, that we do not uh, uh, look them with other eyes, that we uh, create atmosphere. How uh, I want to explain how that each of survivors knows which kind and support she can get from institutions, from NGOs, from international organizations. That is why we in Medica Zenza decided to establish institutional networks that survivors who decide to give testimony have all information, who will get, uh, give her support before testimony, during the testimony, and what is very important after testimony. Uh, most of survivors were disappointed after they gave testimony. They expected that some professionals uh, from institutions or NGOs will help her to deal with uh, 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 in the future. Uh, some testimony uh, is uh, or can be re-traumatized for survivors. What I want to say, and what also Hassan and other colleagues said, we need to educate uh, representatives from institutions 
uh, 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 from uh, codes, how they speak or how they uh, uh, practice stress trauma sensitive approach, how they document their uh, uh, story, life story on sensitive way. Also, very often I listen younger generations, they said, no, we don't want to speak about past. Past, is, it is not part of our life, but we need, we need to listen, to learn from the past to prevent uh, our future. We watch on TV what happened with uh, people in Ukraine. Most of women who survived sexual violence uh, called us, called me and said, Sabiha, that picture re-traumatized me. Through that woman, I see my, my experiences, etc. It means that we, through time, need to create better conditions that survivors really feel safety and security, and then that they decide when they will uh, speak up. If, if I might add to what Sabia said, I think um, what I have noticed, uh, you know, having worked now on the Balkans for 31 years, starting in 1991, what I saw an evolution in Kosovo, and I just might, I, I want to provide this because I think it's important that you had a now a present woman president, but you had an initial woman president. And she came, for example, to Colombia at our World Leaders Forum several years ago. And she said, I want to talk about what happened to my country and the rape of the women in Kosovo. And now you have this present day president and you have them endorsing, putting their arms around these uh, survivors. And they are a part of taking away the shame, actively taking away the shame that they say, these are strong women, these, these women for, for example, Vasfia Goodman, who testified before Congress, as did Nuzreta and uh, Yadranka, they testified in 1997. And I actually was at the hearing with them and I was following them to testify. But when you get official uh, acknowledgement that these harms have come to you, and then you, uh, and then as stakeholders, major leaders, people who are maybe even have celebrity, as as as, as, as everyone's pointed out here, Yasmila Zabanich's film on Gerbavica, which I also use in my classroom. You have a lot of people saying this happened, and it was wrong. And we stand with them in solidarity. And I think that has made a significant, there's been a significant input in Kosovo in, in really diminishing the shame uh, because more and more women came forward when they did the skirt, uh, the skirt exhibition at the football pitch where women were raped at the football pitch in Pristina. Uh, so there's there's ways that we can go about this in 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 a very loving and supportive way that that other people can play beyond psychologists, which are very important, and lawyers. This is really important. It's a leadership role in the world, in their communities, and in the world. And I'd like to see you know President Biden and others speak out about this issue now. I mean, it's just wrong and it's it's heinous and repre reprehensible and we have to speak out. William Hague did this when he was leading the G7. There was a sexual violence initiative. This has to be sustained, sustained over many, many years. Uh, so what Sab Sabiha uh, said um, is really um, interesting to me in terms of uh, the fact that um, what women had gone through from the very beginning till now on every step was a, in a way, secondary victimization, you know, like, it's not just, um, it's not just, uh, the, uh, the fact that, you know, we need to talk about that, of course, you know, uh, but also, um, 
institutions who deal uh, with uh, these victims should be educated. You know, uh, for instance, if if a woman goes on trial as a, as a witness, you know, against a, a, a perpetrator, those who are dealing with uh, um, a woman who uh, was subjected to sex, sexual violence, all those people who deal with with her, they they have to be uh, trained. You know, because yeah. whatever do whatever they do, they re traumatize, yeah. not un unintentionally, because they don't know, they don't know, and uh, I don't know uh, if I'm Sabia can correct me. You know, uh, I uh, what I know is that during the trial, uh, a woman cannot is not recognized in our law as a victim, but on, only as a witness, right? Which is a, it is a, it is a big shame. It is unacceptable, you know. Uh, and I mean, this has to change. Uh, institutions need to be educated. First of all, the whole society needs to change. And for uh, the sake of women of sexual violence, uh, they should be on the side of victims, not on the side of perpetrators. Sometimes perpetrators, even when they are sentenced to compensate uh, victims, they uh, just manage to get away with no compensating because they they transferred all the all the assets to their wives, yep. or to their children, mm -hmm. or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So as Sabia said. Uh, it, you know, they come to the end of the trial and they say, okay, I lost two, three years of uh, witnessing, uh, being witnessed in vain. And eventually at the end, nothing had happened because uh, this uh, perpetrator, perpetrator ended up with no, compens with, uh, with, uh, no compensating to, to, uh, to, to the actual victim. And then he is actually the winner. And who is the loser here is the actual victim. And this really needs to change. Sabiha, do you want to respond directly to what Hassan was saying? Only very short what Hassan also said. When we speak about perpetrators, they have own lawyers. Uh, but when we speak about uh, uh, victim witnesses, they do not have they do not know anything about their uh, 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 right and how how a, a court can protect them. Uh, that is really uh, 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 something for me, what I cannot understand, that perpetrator have legal support lawyers, but victim do not have. And we really need to advocate and lobby for that kind of changes in our country, but also in other countries. I would just like to say, um, in addition to what has been said that um, in this, this question really of what can, what can be done and who, who ought to be thinking about doing what, and I noticed in the um, Q&A, there were some questions about that, specifically um, about educating students and I would like to um, address that and then broaden it a little bit in terms of educating clinicians. And that is that um, I think anybody who ha is in the position of being an educator and um, that uh, and any, time, any type of atrocity or trauma has got to include the Bosnian war and the Bosnian genocide in, ed in the education because even um, programs that often focus on genocide um, sometimes leave it out and that's inexcusable. It needs to be included, basic, very basic. And then anyone who has the opportunity to actually take students to Bosnia, to Sarajevo, to Srebrenica, to the other places should figure out a way to do so. Because as we know, there's nothing like the power of place of actually being somewhere where something happened. And then um, I would say that there are also a lot of uh, people who were um, victims and our survivors of sexual violence who, who live elsewhere now, right? Who live in the States, for example. Tens of thousands of Bosnians live here. And so for people who um, are in the States who are, are clinicians that to, to, to educate ourselves about what happened, how, you know, educate ourselves in terms of trauma-informed treatment and assess, assessment and treatment. And um, most importantly, educate ourselves with the help of people like um, Sabiha, 
and like Hassan and others from Bosnia who, where we can assume um, a, a culturally humble stance and learn what might we do walking alongside um, the, and getting the education and the expertise from those who, who know. Um, so that's what I um, would like to say, thank you. We could go on for a much longer time. Um, I'm aware that we are well beyond um, 90 minutes. And I wanna just say, I'm so grateful to all of you for participating in this and really bringing to light and kind of talking through so many of the nuances of this conversation. I think that um, as for those of us that are part of the international community, wherever we are, um, thinking very clearly about our impact when we go to places, other places that are not our culture, that are not our country with people who are surviving conflicts and wars and violence, including sexual violence, um, going in to learn with an open heart and often just listening to the people around you and what they need is often is the place to start and not going in assuming we know everything because this is how it works in another context. Um, and I also want to thank you all also for doing this work. I know we didn't get to this question, but there is an absolute personal toll it takes on each of you to do this time and again. Um, I remember when survivors of the Yazidi genocide were coming forth, specifically sexual survivors of sexual violence and the amount of trauma that they were not only experiencing, but they were also traumatizing the people there to support them. And I believe the Canadian government was just like at a loss because they had never really encountered that. So um, it takes people like yourselves to do this work with love and support and, and tremendous bravery to help women and to amplify their voices and to make sure that their experiences are not only heard, but they can find at least the kind of recognition and support that they so needed, that they absolutely deserve. So I want to thank you, Sabiha. I want to thank you, Tanya. I want to thank you, Hassan. I want to thank you, Anne, to everyone who stayed on the call. Um, there are a lot of resources in the chat, which we will also copy and send out in our follow-up note. The program has been recorded. We will also send that out to you. Again, my sincerest gratitude. Thank you all so much. We hope you stay safe and be well.